Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to TBA Global Webinar on Fit for Future. Uh, before we begin, just a line of introduction about this uh, webinar. The reason why we're doing this webinar today is because, uh, as you all already know, digitalization here is here to stay. Uh, every company, every person, every uh, every individual, as well as every company is being impacted by digitalization. So much so that a whole new system for taxing this digital economy is currently being developed by national and international governments together. So what can companies do in this digital environment to be successful? And it is not just limited to managing your legal compliance and tax processes, but also what kind of strategy you should adopt to stay lean, efficient, and still customer-centric is going to be the main focus of today's webinar. Uh, if we will start, as you can see on the screen, we are your presenters for today. I'm Avisha, and I have my colleague with me, Anusha, here as well. And the structure of this web, uh, webinar will be, we'll start with a presentation from our side, and we'll keep the last 10 minutes to answer any questions you may have. Uh, all of you may have a question box in front of you on your screen in which you can type the questions, but um, if you will allow us, we will be answering those questions towards the end of the webinar in the last 10 minutes. With this, I ask Anisha to take you through the index of this webinar. Yes. So in this webinar, we'll be covering what is the impact of digitalization on various business models. For example, the banking industry, the hospitality industry. We will also be discussing how we have to balance agility and efficiency while still focusing on customer behavior. And lastly, how to set up the governance of an industry or of a company in light of digitalization. So moving on to the next slide. So. As you know already, digitalization has become impossible to predict and how companies have always been fascinated by, with the aspect of capturing data. That is initially from capturing data in a hard drive to USB stick to now moving to big data analytics. This has been the starting point for digitalization as well. So what the companies are now doing is they're analyzing the data from the customers, various market research, putting in a lot of effort to see what do the customers want, what is the need of the customers so that the product offerings of the companies can be in that area. In this regard, one of the examples is also in the e-commerce industry, how various e-commerce platform uh, companies such as Amazon, Alibaba are now offering different products to customers, analyzing the data in the market, the present data in the market to see what should be the product offerings. So as you can see, the market diversity is increasing, the customer demands are increasing. Along with that, there is a supplier cooperation. Now the suppliers are also developing joint networks to provide more uh, products to the customers. And at the same time, this is also increasing the competitor base for industries with various players now diversifying their business models and entering the e-commerce platforms. So moving on to the next slide. This is an example of e-commerce impact on the retail industry specifically. So what has happened is, as you can see on this slide, the e-commerce, uh, basically the online retailers such as ASOS and Boohoo have larger, uh, have lesser supply chain lead times as a result of uh, directly just analyzing the data of the customer and manufacturing, having a very less supply chain lead time by manufacturing the garments and directly having it on their website within a period of two to three days. But whereas the rest of them still focus on shifting the or delivering the goods from the manufacturers to the uh, warehouse, to the store, and then to the customer. So e-commerce has really brought in a shift in the retail industry by ASOS and Boohoo capturing a greater market share because of reduction in supply chain times because of their respective platforms. And that has been possible, uh, do you think also, Anusha, by collection of data in this respect, that they focus on what customers want and try to deliver that to begin with instead of running their 
whole set of manufacturing uh, setup which was common for retailers earlier right so yes definitely there, there has been an impact of that so what had happened in the traditional retail industry they used to it was uh, the retail industry you, the companies used to think themselves what are the product offerings they want the pro manufacturing process used to happen a year before the products are actually launched in the market whereas now they look at what is uh, because of this big data analytics they are able to have access to what the customer trends are they have access to facebook instagram and various other market research platforms where they study the consumer behavior they see what is the latest trend in the fashion week and with respect of that they don't have to spend a lot of time in developing designs etc so that's where they save costs and more emphasis is to just interpret what design is in the market what are the trends in the market to just convert it to direct garment being there on the website of the retail platforms so that has also had an impact on the supply chain lead times right so another example is uh, an increasing what we have witnessed now is the emergence of a data factory so i would want to explain what is a data factory in light of the telecom and media uh, industry so telecom and media industry as you are aware of are uh, asset heavy industries telecom industry primarily relies on uh, antennas build uh, buildings etc and whereas basically the heavy architecture that they need to invest significant costs in right. building it's, it's very centric on a particular infrastructure that is required to provide a service whereas for media industry the, the lot of money is spent on creating specific content for the customer but what is this data factory then data factory is basically a very asset light industry to put it simply which ju is just a streaming platform so what essentially they do is they give a small commission fee to the media houses and to different internet service providers to just stream uh the movies music etc so as you see in data factory we have some examples of youtube netflix which is the biggest player at the moment amazon prime so what we notice is because uh companies have to invest a lot in telecom and media industries specifically so and they do not see enough return coming out of it because the wireless uh, platforms are also becoming really weak with everyone now nowadays launching their own wireless networks etc as well and uh, the production houses also do not see enough revenue being generated in respect of whatever inputs that they provide so all the there is an increasing trend of a mergers coming from telecom and media houses and entering the data factory some recent examples are of AT&T Time Warner where AT&T wants to make because AT&T is now witnessing a drop in the wireless network revenue that they had so now they want to increasingly showcase, uh, showcase uh, videos etc on uh, their streaming platforms on their phones etc similarly disney and 21st century fox have witnessed netflix as a big competitor for them so now they want to launch two new platforms two new online platforms by 2019 which will be on the line of netflix and similarly the third is in the case of verizon and yahoo where verizon has acquired the web streaming uh, web advertising business of yahoo to study more market and uh, launch its advertising to the present yahoo customers and uh, one more increasing uh, aspect that has to be seen for data factory is that instead of return on investment now there's shift and focus on return on data that is the revenues generated per user per subscriber so more users you have more subscribers you have it can directly be converted into revenue and you don't have to wait for a period of time to see what return on the heavy investments that you've made you're getting so it, in real time basis basically you generate revenue so this is another uh, data factory is another example of digitalization that is true today. and this is helping reduce costs for customers because customers at the end of the day let's say a customer of disney wants to just see a movie if they earlier they were had to buy cds to uh, watch that movie or watch it, if they didn't watch it in the theater of course and a part of that cd sales would go to the distribution distribution network of disney that 
part is completely eliminated by someone like Netflix coming in and Netflix is not investing any money of its own in creation of that content. Netflix may have a different arm that does that, but in its data factory role, it is only liaising with people who have created content and people who want to watch the content. Now, Netflix con collects its own data and now is doing various experiments to decide uh, whether it can do some, with whether it can implement some premium models other than a standard subscription as well. So the main point of this slide is that it is all while it is customer centric behavior, one is customer centric behavior that is driving these companies to be successful. And secondly, this collection of data is continuously helping them improve their service offerings and make them more customized to the needs of the customers needs of the yeah exactly customers as well so this is something that is a little bit of a change seen from traditional to the newly digital business model right that's why as you see the impact here is the revenue is generated through return on data. So more number of subscribers, more number of users. So you have to engage with the customer base. You have to identify which are going to be your loyal customers because more you increase your customer base, more are going to more is your revenue basically. So the impact is no longer in your traditional business model where the focus was more heavy investment you make, more return you get out of it. Now it's basically to increase your customer base. Yeah, invest in your customers. Create loyalty in your customers. Okay, so the next slide is linked to the previous uh, discussions on data factory that we had. So as we already discussed, market diversity is really increasing now in light of digitalization. It can be seen in all three aspects relating to customer behavior, supplier trends, competitor increase in competitors. For example, in respect of customers, there is access to more markets through e-commerce. That is uh, now companies are expanding to other uh, distribution platforms as well. And for example, Alibaba is now expanding from a traditional distributor player to uh, that of uh, Alipay as well, what we will discuss in the next slides. Mm -hmm. So now they are targeting customers who had issues with the traditional banking industry and who had issues with the payment mechanisms in some countries paying for their products, etc. Now they are looking at those customers and are expanding to new markets. Another is uh, focus on intermediary type of countries, uh, companies, for example, Uber, which provides a platform for a driver to engage with a customer. So there as well, what Uber does is they look at the, the customer behavior. They look at whether there's a high demand in a particular area. And uh, according to that, the service offerings, the, pro uh, the prices of the product, uh, the taxi service also increases. So studying the customer, increasing customer demands also uh, le leads to a shift in the revenue that they have. So higher the customer demand, more is the revenue that they generate out of it through search pricing as you would have witnessed. Similarly with suppliers as previously uh, discussed, they are going in for partnerships to increase a supplier base so that more goods can be offered to customer in real time basis. Another point as discussed is increasing customers, uh, increasing competitiveness. That is as a result of a company expanding to other business areas as well. For example, Alibaba is expanding to other business models as well. From being just a traditional distributor, it is now also entering in the area of the banking industry. And so, this competitive point is rather interesting, right? A complete someone who is involved only in distribution is now your banking partner as well. Would you have ever imagined such a diverse portfolio of services as well as therefore customers before? Never has it been possible unless the impact of, uh, before the advent of technology and thereafter the digital economy that has led companies, that has given companies the power to mm. expand to any area in which customers need service. Right. So for a business to be fit for the future, one of the key characteristics is that it's willing to evolve over a period of time that it is able to identify its value drivers and actually optimize its value drivers to expand to other business areas. And we can see that Alibaba has been able to successfully do that by seeing that in China, maybe the consumers are having issue in paying uh, 
through e banking etc because maybe they were charged some interest etc so now ali baba has uh, expanded to ali pay and wechat has also come up with wechat pay where uh, banks are just used as means of storing your money whereas all the transactions actually happen through this ali pay app and wechat pay app so if you would see in the next slide uh, the traditional in the traditional model a customer had to themselves approach a bank all had to fill out forms it was wholly a, a manual process then it shifted to banks getting uh, involved with fintech and uh, getting involved with e banking aspect of things to keep things moving in the age of digitalization however companies like alibaba have been really really efficient where are still keeping in mind the the customer behavior and keeping the businesses agile as well by launching platforms like alipay where the customers just by way of downloading a simple app can complete an online transaction so the banking industry has been heavily impacted by this true thanks asha uh, the main focus we've been talking about has been on the fact that businesses have to be customer centric to keep up now it is easy to uh, use the words customer centric first of all what does customer centric mean and how to in, uh, how to make sure that customer centric behavior is implemented across your organization is what is needed for a business to be fit for future so let's say uh, if we look at the slide it presently uh, in the old economy anyone would start any traditional a uh, business company would start with r&d procurement manufacturing delivery and would run after that a cycle of uh, somewhere in the middle with a cycle of marketing and identifying trends in the market to customize its requirement to the customers a bit say for example as of now uber collects your data on a real time basis it says if if you are in the area that you are located currently there are too many people wanting to take uber the prices of it go down go up suddenly and those price the search pricing remain for 5 minutes sometimes 5 15 minutes sometimes an hour sometimes and when comes to normal traditional businesses if someone was offering like a taxi service would have had to do run a up to a 6 months or year of service to find out what are the peak times in which customers are buying the service the most what are the peak areas in which customers are buying the most so they would have had to do a lot more running around and ground work in order to charge higher prices or premium prices for making available a service in crowded times or in crowded areas etc so this is the and that so basically that benefit to customers would have trickled much later trickled down much later and at a higher cost whereas with real time data collection not just collection but also its analysis and translation into a service here in the uber example the translation into a service is the serv the standard service suddenly becoming premium service for a matter of half an hour So that is the value digital businesses bring with them so if we look here uh, again on the slide the old economy based business models would start with as we said r&d purchasing manufacturing and then deliver whereas with the new business models the first stage is you go out in the market and identify what your customers are doing the, now everyone's posting everyone's collecting everyone's data be it companies like apple facebook or instagram or these companies or companies doing research using these platforms to identify what are the key trends in the market what are the customers in the market doing is first and foremost and only based on what the customers are looking for then you get into a cycle of starting to purchase accordingly manufacture if needed and then deliver a product or excuse me or service that is desired by the market so the main focus is not earlier most traditional businesses made their money by becoming like a trusted name in the society say a company such as 
Phillips, which has a very long standing history, soon became an everyday common name in every household, and people started associating quality with that name of the brand, which led to the success of the brand. But in the current business, in the current digital economy, um, in the current uh, setup, which is run through digital economy, this brand loyalty is no longer present. Customers want someone to be their trusted partner and providing a solution that is customized to their needs. So that, say for example, if we take a look for at the second slide. Uh, there are platforms such as Expedia, Booking.com, etc. coming up that are giving customers a platform through which they can make their hotel bookings, flight bookings, um, uh, car rentals, as well as some insurance, travel insurances, and also they can arrange. So right now, that's why more and more customers are flocking to Expedia and Booking.com type platforms because these platforms are minimizing the steps in their process of booking a trip. And as well as these platforms contain reliable references from other users who have provided input on using the platform, input on or reviews on the quality of service provided by an airplane, a hotel, a car service, etc., which helps the users make an informed choice. So earlier, why a customer may want to be associated with, okay, I always stay in Hilton uh, because they provide, they come, someone comes and greets me at the door. My, uh, I can always be guaranteed a clean room, etc., etc. But now, platforms such as Expedia are already providing this information in the form of reviews, and uh, which is leading customers to not be loyal to just one one brand. Because in the current world, there are so many options for each and everything available. Reviews are becoming a lot more important. And platforms such as these collaborative platforms such as Expedia, which in the back end have a wide network of suppliers ranging from hotel providers to airplane companies to car rental companies, and in the front end have a wide range of customers using these services. This is what is the future of businesses. Instead of having a monopolistic setup and drawing on brand loyalty, making an experience very useful to a customer is the way to go forward. Like, sir, so what do you think, uh, does it have an impact on the traditional hotel industry as itself? Like is the traditional hotel industry also witnessing some trends by studying the customer behavior? Because now they see that Expedia kind of players are having an impact on their businesses, reducing the revenue chunk. So do you think they are also evolving and changing and providing different customer experiences? Actually, that's true. And a good point here because it's not just platforms such as Expedia that are going to be successful. The main focus is being customer-centric. Just last week, I was reading about this uh, NH Hotel, which now allow a customer when they book with them to choose even a room, like virtually look at a room, get a virtual tour of the hotel and just like you would choose your seat on a plane similarly the nh hotels were also allowing you to look at the room and choose where you want to stay in the hotel so that is also an example of a hotel stepping out of its traditional shoes and making a step forward taking a step forward in being in making the customer experience a little bit more useful for the customer so well, another example of it is just uh, what we talked about a little bit earlier as well. Uh, how Uber is revolutionizing the travel industry. Earlier, everyone was focused on buying a car, uh, either through an ownership model, like real bank paying up front and buying a car or through leasing that you pay a certain less amount which made it a little bit easier to make monthly payments and get a still get ownership of a car so <clears throat> excuse me ownership was still quite important but in the digital economy as anusha alluded to earlier as well returns are not focused on investments the investments are going down and down and data collection is going up and up 
So going forward, people wanted to earlier use cars always to get from point A to point B. Earlier, the method to get from point A to point B was either use public transport or purchase your own vehicle. But now, in this revolutionizing industry, companies such as Uber are providing what they call mobility solutions, which just means, okay, you want to get from point A to point B, there can be a, an Uber, you can use your phone to make that happen, you choose your starting point and your end point, you see what payment you need to make, you get an indication of it in the app, you make the selection of what type of car you want, and after you press the button, a car is arriving with, at your doorstep within a few minutes. And who knows, going forward in the future, those cars may be even driverless cars coming out of a self-regulated parking garage somewhere located in the vicinity of your house. So the focus on providing customer-centric services because at the end of the day, ownership of products only leads to more costs, both at the end of the manufacturer as well as the user. So going forward, the idea is more on just finding a solution to an imminent need, which is evident in all successful digital economy-based business models. Uh, this slide goes on to stress again on the same point we've been talking about how uh, a digital economy success, a successful company in this digital economy needs to be customer centric. Well, we have used enough examples to say how can a company be customer centric, but that customer centric behavior also needs to be replicated company wide. What do we mean by this replication uh, within the company? Say, for example, um, uh, the hotel. The, let's uh, use the same example of the hotels we were we were talking about. Say, uh, a company, NH hotels, want to provide customers the option to choose their room, or want to provide customers an option to. Uh, not just pay for all of the services, but pay for, say, as they go, like provide an enriching customer experience where the customer comes in, gets a view of all the services that are on offer, but makes the payment for only what they need. That is, if a company wants to deliver this to a customer, they are not going to be able to do this if they conduct their internal business in the traditional manner. Say, for example, if a hotel continues to abide by its 10-year-old uh, list of suppliers who have long-term contracts with them, receiving a fixed fee all the time, uh, while at the front end, the company wants to offer only pay-as-you-go kind of service, if they don't reduce their fixed costs in the back and have like a network of collaborative suppliers, one of which is chosen to provide a service as and when the customer demands it, it is no, never going to be possible for companies to be, for companies to be able to uh, function, uh, function in an efficient and co cost efficient and effective manner. Yeah. So which is why this customer centric behavior needs to be replicated across the company. And one of the key messages again here is, do not start take, taking ownership of everything. Uh, being an established name should not be synonymous with, uh, being, an, uh, being an established name should not be synonymous with you owning and doing everything, but you being a trusted partner that can connect the customer to the right provider. Right. So, Visha, what I see here is that the emphasis in the, the these kind of business models is on profit sharing basis. For example, in the case of Uber, Uber when it has a tie up with the drive uh, with the people who drive cars for them or who own the cars themselves and drive the cars. So there, Uber only takes about twenty to twenty five percent of the profit of the drivers, right? See, they have yes. to pay, correct. So seventy to seventy five percent is still retained with the drive the drivers and owner of the cars whereas Uber gets the rest of the share. So this has contributed to a successful business model for them, right? Correct. The drivers just pay a fee for using the platform or being connected on the Uber platform. 
and yes they pay only about 25 percent of the total fare that you and i would pay to uber instead of uber just owning all the cars and paying the drivers a significant amount in salary thereby raising its opex as well so this is a reflection of a customer centric behavior within a company as well uh, the next slide just presents um, an illustration of uh, a sort of a conclusion of a conclusive illustration of what we have been saying. So, what should the business ecosystem of a fit for future business look like? At the front end are, of course, the customers, the data from which has to be collected, and that still remains the most important point, or uh, important point for a company delivering its products or services. But in traditional business models or already established traditional businesses, the focus was on improving or uh, bringing operational efficiencies rather than creating new things every day, every day. Whereas for a digital economy based company, while operating efficiencies are definitely important, strategy not just on strategy on how to do things more efficiently but strategy based on all sorts of external factors being markets competitors other um, environmental changes and to some extent all other things are becoming a lot more relevant so this is where the function of uh, supervisory boards also becomes a lot more relevant instead of meeting just four to six times a year where discussions are rather plenary on uh, how well the business is going how much revenue is being generated how much bonuses are being paid out the, the supervisory board should also take an active role in assessing the market climate the need for the services not just at present but in the next 10 years how much of relevance that business is going to bring to society is going to be a decisive factor in whether that business is, go is here to stay or not uh, as you can see on this slide uh, the idea is the all arrows pretty much go everywhere so the idea is for it to be a complete cyclical process where information is fed in used to deliver service but it doesn't just stop there most traditional businesses use the cycle ran the cycle uh, came up to a product or service they wanted to sell and when they found something that is being sold in the market is selling in the market then they would just start to make it more efficient way of selling or a little better version of that service or product whereas in this changing uh, society needs of consumers are ever changing as well and as we said before a solution to those needs needs to be produced rather than a product or service or the most beautiful way of providing a product or service a solution to the need requirements of the customer is what needs to be developed so uh, to summarize, uh, the focus of the supervisory boards when they're framing the strategy shouldn't just be a high level overview of what the company should do, but should actually delve into what are the value creating factors for that particular industry or how they can optimize and gain the maximum from the value creating elements. For example, if the value creation is focused on one particular aspect of their business in one particular country, then they need to decide how this should that business operating model look like. Should the operating model be based on a single business entity concept or should it be on a multiple business entity concept? So earlier the emphasis was just as Avisha was mentioning to increase the efficiencies in their supply chain. But now it's also on how you have to frame your business operating model. Choose your business operating model to such a way that you can supply the goods or services to the customers in the most optimal manner while also keeping in mind the concept of shared value where you also keep in mind the needs of the society. For example, in the case of Nestle, which looked at the coffee, the conditions of the coffee plantation workers and saw that they were not getting a good chunk of the profits from the coffee beans that they were selling to Nestle. So Nestle decided to invest in the coffee plantation uh, plantations of these workers. They gave them pesticides, etc. regularly, supported their needs, 
entered into agreements with them to buy a certain percentage of the coffee beans so that they would get regular returns so the governance model of that company also focused on the society needs as well so the emphasis on by the supervisory board should also be on creating the shared value so that the business ecosystem is can be seen by the customers and associated with that particular advantage that they provided to the society and uh, so that they can move forward keeping this in mind the next slide focuses on how a digital business model needs to balance both agility and efficiency in order in order to survive in the future so in order to uh, be a digital business model it cannot just afford to focus uh, on the customer behavior and uh, see what are the customer trends and just change their business model in that manner it also has to keep in mind the cost efficiencies and uh, pay emphasis on shared service centers and not ignore this concept of cost efficiencies in this process so profits will only be seen in the future for a particular business model if it has cost efficiencies where are still balancing the needs of the customers so uh, what should your business operating model look like so in on this slide you will see various uh, variables listed which you can choose from to make your business operating model which is fit for the future the first one that we can see is a fiscal legal setup that is you can choose to have a single business entity model where a single entity issues invoices to the customers is dealing with the customers or is another multiple multi entity business model where in your group you appoint a particular entity as an invoicing entity which issues invoices to the customers another is a business process setup basically you have to first see who are, who is your customer base to whom are you targeting what kind of processes are required to deliver that service to the customer if you have that in place you establish certain business processes maybe through erp design and it setup says that when you providing and have identified your various business processes you need to have an it configuration in place to support this an example can be for this can be uber so uber's main business comes through customers and the drivers looking at the uber app looking at and matching basically what the app does is match a driver with a customer so if the app crashes tomorrow uber's revenue goes significantly down they get really affected by this app crashing in some countries basically so the it set up for them is the key point in their business operating model so they invest really heavily in a good it setup so and another point is on organization so in the business operating model the roles of the people need to be clearly defined you need to have raci chalked out that that is who is responsible accountable consulted and to be informed in your organization to act in an efficient and effective manner like the business operating model then anusha should also be uh, ref a reflection of what the company is portraying to its customers as its products and services if it is the most important element if there are platform then of course it should work well right uh, so depending on how the customer also sees your for example for uber customers when they see the app they know that this is a company which has an it setup which is really strong so the business operating model they can also see they have a decentralized multi entity business model different entities in different countries invoicing the customers via the app so the app still remains centric to their business and is most important so it depends on whereas the organization setup might not be so important in the case of uber as it's the app through which all the transactions happen whereas in another supply chain kind of an organization for example in amazon they need to identify the roles and responsibilities of who is important in the supply chain who is the one who is in charge of logistics warehousing for example and who needs to be informed when a courier leaves the warehouse and when it reaches the customer because the, uh, this is most important for suppose for amazon so your business operating model also reflects on the customer so the customer subconsciously does realize what kind of a business operating model does a company have and in order to 
provide your services efficiently as we were saying this customer centric model needs to be reflected uh, company wide internally as well okay and so when part how uh, continuing on how to reflect this customer centric model in within your organization is also a two step process one being yeah you reflect it in your operations for example you do not incur incur additional fixed costs for yourself if you are if the services you are providing are based on a pay as you go model the another very important element of what you can do to reflect the customer centric behavior within your organization is the is a correct implementation of a governance model so now governance model can have two uh, ways of looking at it one the company deciding from top down like implementing per the workflow in a process deciding who is going to be responsible accountable consulted and informed and secondly empowering people to deliver which means getting that motivation from top from bottoms up that is motivating the people at the gr on ground and on location in within your company in order to in order to help them contribute towards your shared value ecosystem that you are portraying to your customers so if we go a little bit more in detail about what is the top down governance model so it can have uh, as you can see on the slide three main elements or can be looked at in three main ways uh, so in order to have an efficient governance process you first of all need to have a clear and transparent uh, reflection of your business processes so as you all know there are various processes that some companies would adopt to map out workflows order to for, let's say for example order to pay is an one example so if a companies uh, companies typically would break down the their value chain into various processes so for each process should be transparently explained to all stakeholders within and outside at least within the company now after having explained those processes it becomes easier automatically to chalk out roles and responsibility per workflow within that process so that's step number 1 for setting up a governance model that first you in teach each and every one about what are the workflows and what are the processes that the that your company follows for from start to finish of in your process of value creation as a next uh, as a next step uh, now we when we break this down to digital economy specific companies uh, the focus is a lot more on collection of data so you can not have such set processes in place all the time however even if there are not not all of your services can be a part of the set process therefore show us some so let's say if we were continuing to take example of uber it uh, in order to deliver its service it runs a process however uber also keeps collecting real time data from customers and using that real time data another product or service which uber does not currently deliver may become possible for example that's how led that's what led to the creation of uber eats when uber first started work uh, its business model its idea was to bring people from point a to point b but so they had their governance framework only applicable for this process but while collecting data and in an attempt to see what else is needed in the market they saw that oh instead of just getting people from one place to another we can maybe get food to them as well and that was that for that they needed they need to then set up yet another governance model governance roles and that is what is meant by sometimes the central department is focused on only one process however more may need to be continuously created especially in the digital economy when customers are becoming more and more demanding uh, so so similarly uh, this allows for all types of customer needs to be taken into account without disrupting the main processes of running an operational business model 
the second part about uh, the second uh, part about governance was uh, empowering people to deliver uh, this is this is another way of running a company like uh, if you are as a company have an idea you want to implement to make a product or a service you definitely have an approach in mind and people who come and join and work for you or with you are somewhat aligned to that idea but it's only for so long that you can carry on operations in this manner without becoming a monopolistic entity which we have as we have seen before is not the way to succeed in digital economy so now if you have to rely on people for providing services and products uh, for pro sorry, for being your suppliers enabling you to provide products and services to your customers uh, then you need to make sure that a little bit of profit is shared with those people as well that's what that's what makes people empowered rather than running a strict set of operations where you as a company are the one claiming all the residual profit that brings us also back to our initial slide on return on investment versus return on data that if you were to invest a lot more be it in your employees be it in your infrastructure be it in your processes the returns you can get on that in the digital economy are growing lower and you have to be dependent on a collaborative network of suppliers to continue being successful and in order to com competently rely on a network of suppliers you need to you need to empower them to work with you as well and one of the strongest motivation has proven to be a case of profit sharing such as with the drivers of uber that anusha was alluding to earlier a fun more point uh, after having focused a bit on what should be the operational setup for businesses in this digital economy another uh, point that remains to be talked about is what does this mean from a tax point of view as you may recall we started with saying that national and international governments are trying to build a new system of taxation for this economy but till that system is built these companies are not the are not stopping these companies are still growing so what can be done what does this mean in terms of taxation of these companies because that's also a very important element you need to keep in mind in order to really be fit for future right so one of the things as simple as that from the tax perspective is your documentation is your transfer pricing documentation so under a master file now you require to demonstrate or showcase the value chain of your company so in the retail industry previously it was just focused on manufacturing starting from or maybe procurement then manufacturing uh, warehousing and then uh, customer like taking the product to the store and uh, where the the sales would take place directly to the customer whereas now it starts from first data analytics there is no uh, so much a focus on procurement of fabrics etc data analytics become analysis becomes the first part that is you see as discussed previously you see the trends on instagram facebook do your market research get into production immediately seeing what the consumer wants and instead of uh, taking the clothes to uh, a store from the warehouse to a store from the warehouse the delivery takes place directly to the customers through the online platforms so the value chain is really changing uh, for the retail well, industry right? yes and as this, as avisha just mentioned now what is happening as a result of these efficiencies coming in the retail industry is that the profit margin is also uh, going down the the margins are also reducing so for example if you have entered into if a retail industry player has entered into apa agreements in some of the countries regarding one arm of their operations for example manufacturing and want to uh, have agreed upon cost plus 3% or 5% type of remuneration now as a result of the shrinking margins what they can agree upon with the apa authorities is that they are willing to give compensation of suppose x percent of their value chain so what is now essential is 
analyzing and looking at each element of your value chain and looking what value it uh, contributes to your business and accordingly uh, agreeing with the tax authorities on some level of remuneration which will suffice for the value created by that arm of your business so like for example if you were to enter into a cost plus 5% apa with one tax authority and when you entered into that apa at that time that cost plus 5% meant 1% of your overall value chain margin but that apa was agreed into for 5 years and after 3 years your value chain overall margins have gone down from 15 to 12% so what was earlier 1% of your value chain margin has now increased to maybe a little bit more than 1% yes is your business sustainable is your business competent to take care of that additional margin or is it related to some fixed cost that you have made for yourself in terms of taxation right so this needs to also be addressed uh in cup for companies in the future years as they continue to keep evolving and the business models keep continuing to change so the communication with the tax authorities needs to be continuously done and explained on a regular basis along with documenting your value chain in master files along with documenting your real time numbers in c by c reports a continuous dialogue with tax authorities on these changing value chains is essential unless a clear mechanism to tax digital economy can be developed uh, we, these slides will be distributed to all of you along with the recording of the mm -hmm. webinar uh, in case of questions here later or any observations you would like to share with us on this topic please feel free to contact us on the emails on the screen thank you very much for joining and we wish you a good evening